This here is George Danzig, the inventor of the simplex method, which is the first and still one of the most widely used algorithms for solving linear programs. In January of 2000, there was a journal called Computing in Science and Engineering that ranked what they felt were the most important algorithms in the past century. The simplex method came out to be one of the top 10 algorithms with, quote, the greatest influence on the development and practice of science and engineering in the 20th century. But why is this algorithm so important? It's mainly because it's really fast and also it can be applied to lots of applications. An enormous number of problems can be modeled as a linear program. For example, you have things like scheduling aircraft, optimizing an investment portfolio, and deciding on the optimal routes to deliver packages. These are some areas where linear programs can be applied. Also, it's very fundamental to computer science. For example, you might know that to find the shortest path between two points in a graph, you can use something called Dijkstra's algorithm. Did you know that you can also formulate it as a linear program? Also, computing a minimum cost matching in a bipartite graph can also be written as a linear program. Sometimes it even shows up in machine learning, for example, in fitting a line to data. The simplex method can solve all of these problems, and so it was a huge deal, and it was a major breakthrough in computer science. I'm planning to go deeper into some of these applications in future videos, so if you're interested, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Surprisingly, for an algorithm so important, the main ideas aren't that complicated. My goal in this video is to communicate these main ideas, and also by the end, you should be able to carry out a few iterations of simplex on your own. First, we'll talk about how we can characterize a vertex of the feasible region. Optimal solutions for linear programs occur at these vertices. Next, there's a pre-processing step that needs to occur before we can start the simplex method, where we need to transform the linear program into something called standard form. Then we need to find an initial vertex. This is needed in order to start simplex. Finally, we learn what each iteration of the simplex method looks like, and also what's happening graphically. All right, let's get started. Here is a linear program and its feasible region. If a linear program has an optimal solution, it occurs at a vertex of its feasible region. If you want a bit more detail on this fact, I talk about it in my previous video on the graphical method. These dashed lines represent the points where the constraints are satisfied at equality. For example, this is the line 3x plus 5y equals 15, which is where the second constraint is satisfied at equality. Notice that at least two constraints are satisfied at equality at each vertex. There is a special terminology for this. We say these constraints are tight at these vertices. For example, the first two constraints, shown in yellow on the left, are tight at the vertex 15 eighths, 15 eighths. Each of the other vertices are also tight at at least two constraints. For this last vertex, it's actually tight at three constraints. So a vertex can sometimes be tight at more than two constraints. Finally, just finding the point where two constraints are tight does not necessarily give a vertex. As an example, these two highlighted constraints are tight at the point 0, 3. But 0, 3 is not feasible because it violates the first constraint, shown in purple. So feasibility is also required. To summarize, a vertex is a point that is feasible and where at least two constraints are tight. Our observations in two dimensions can be generalized to cases where we have more than two variables. Suppose we have n variables. Then the first difference is that we need to have at least n tight constraints at a vertex v instead of just two. The number of tight constraints at a vertex has to be at least the number of variables that we have. The second condition, that the point v has to be feasible, still remains the same. The simplex method essentially jumps from vertex to vertex in each iteration, and maintains these two conditions at all times. So it's important to remember these conditions because it's really important for the algorithm. To perform simplex, we first need to translate the linear program into something called standard form. Here, x1 to xn are our decision variables, which we'll color in purple. The rest are constants. Standard form is where the only inequalities that we have is that the variables are non-negative. All other constraints are equality constraints. And all linear programs can be transformed into standard form. 
let's try transforming the following linear program. First, we need to transform the objective from a min to a max. Minimizing a function is equal to maximizing the negative of that function. So we just multiply the objective by minus 1 and change it to a max. Now we need to transform the three middle inequalities into equality constraints. The key is to introduce new variables. For the first constraint, we subtract the variable s1 and transform the inequality into an equality. The idea behind this is that if x minus y is greater than 0, then there is some surplus in the first constraint. After subtracting the surplus, we have an equality constraint. The surplus is always non-negative. The second constraint is similar, but since it's a less than or equal to constraint, we add a variable s2. For less than or equal to constraints, these new variables are called slack variables. It measures the space, so to say, remaining in the constraint. Like before, s2 is non-negative. And we do the same for the third constraint. Finally, x and y are non-negative from before. These two problems are equivalent in the sense that we can transform a feasible point from one to the other and vice versa. Also, the optimal objective value is the same for both. For example, let's take the point x equals 3, y equals 1. This is feasible in the first problem, and you can check that it satisfies all of the constraints. For the standard form linear program, x and y are the same. Then, we can find the slacks and surpluses in the constraints and get a corresponding feasible point for the standard form linear program. This new problem now has five decision variables and eight constraints, so it seems like we just made our problem much more complicated. But actually, it greatly simplifies our characterization of the vertices. Recall the two conditions we need for point V to be a vertex. How do these conditions apply to standard form linear programs? For the second condition, that V is feasible, we can rephrase it as V must satisfy all M equality constraints, and all variables are non-negative. The first condition, that a vertex needs to have at least n tight constraints at v, can also be simplified. Notice that for standard form linear programs, all feasible points have to satisfy these m equality constraints. Therefore, this means that for a vertex to be tight at n constraints, n minus m of these non-negativity constraints have to be tight. Or in other words, n minus m decision variables need to be zero. These are the conditions for standard form LPs. Let's try to use these new conditions to find the vertex for the linear program we had before. Here we have five variables and three equality constraints. So by the first condition, we need to set two variables to zero. Let's try to set x and y to be zero. We can solve for the slack and surplus variables using the equality constraints, giving us the following solution. There's actually a term for the variables we force to be zero. These are called non-basic variables. As you can guess, the other variables are called basic variables. So the first condition can be reworded as, we can choose n minus m variables to be non-basic. We can check that the two conditions are satisfied. We actually got lucky here. After we solved for s1, s2, and s3, all variables turned out to be non-negative, so the solution is feasible. In general, finding an initial vertex isn't as easy as what we just did. Sometimes when we set n minus m variables to be non-basic and solve for the remaining, the solution turns out to be infeasible. So usually we need to use something called the two-phase simplex method. I won't cover this in this video, but I will leave a reference in the description box below. If you understand the regular simplex method, the two-phase simplex method is just a small extension. Now we'll get into how to actually perform an iteration of the simplex method. On the left, we have the original linear program in its feasible region. On the right, we have the linear program in standard form, as well as the initial vertex that we found. 
This initial vertex corresponds to the purple dot on the feasible region of the original linear program. Now, to perform simplex, we need to transform the linear program into something called the simplex tableau. There are a few steps. First, we won't explicitly write the non-negativity constraints. They'll still be there, we just won't write them. Next, we rewrite the constraints such that the non-basic variables are all on one side. Here are the non-basic variables for this vertex are x and y. Finally, we'll let the objective be denoted as z. This final form is the simplex tableau, or actually, it's the form I like to write it as. There's no standard way of writing the tableau, and other teachers or books may write the tableau in a different way. A tableau corresponds to a vertex. Here the non-basic variables are on the right, and remember they're equal to zero. So, we can easily read off the values of the basic variables. Our goal is to increase z, so we need to increase one of the non-basic variables. Let's try to increase x. How much can we increase x while still remaining feasible? Remember that all variables have to be non-negative. can't increase x past 4, otherwise s2 becomes negative. We can also see this graphically, that we shoot outside of the feasible region. Okay, we can increase x to 4, but then it becomes a basic variable. s2 is now 0 and becomes non-basic. So we have to follow our rule and move x to the left-hand side of the tableau. We have to also get rid of all traces of x on the right-hand side by substituting in this new equation. Then we simplify. Now we have a new tableau. s2 and y are the new non-basic variables and we need to increase one of them. We don't want to increase s2 because that would decrease z. So we have to increase y, and we can increase it to 3, any more would make s3 negative. Afterwards, y becomes basic, and s3 becomes non-basic. Okay, this is the final tableau because we cannot increase either s2 or s3 without decreasing the objective because of these minus signs. The optimal value is 7, which we can read straight from the tableau. And the optimal point is that x equals 4, y equals 3. Note that we traveled across the bottom edge and up the right edge of the feasible region. Simplex essentially travels along the edges of the feasible region until it reaches the optimal point. Could we have traveled along the upper path instead? In fact, we could have. Let's go back to our original tableau, which corresponded to the vertex at the origin with x and y as non-basic. Previously, we increased x, but what happens when we increase y instead? We can't increase y at all because any small amount will make s1 negative. However, we can still make y basic and s1 non-basic. Making this switch doesn't change the vertex, but it does change the tableau. But now with this new tableau, we can increase x to 3, which will make s3 non-basic. In the final step, we can increase s1 to 1, and then s2 becomes non-basic. This is the same optimal tableau that we saw before. Our choice of which variable becomes basic therefore determines the path the simplex algorithm takes to reach the optimal vertex. Hopefully you have some more intuition now on the simplex method. If you have any questions or if you found some parts unclear, leave a comment below. Thanks.